Hello and welcome to this, the Books Crypto Club weekly catch up on Zoom. It's Sunday, the 2nd of May 2021, and we're going to be talking about uh, various topics of cryptocurrency. The agenda is not fixed. We end up talking about anything that anyone wants to. So hopefully you'll find this of interest. If you do, uh, do remember to click on that subscribe button, click the like, click the reminder bell so that you get notified when we have uh, future sessions. As I say, we, we meet every Sunday, just an informal chat about DeFi, NFTs, crypto, blockchain, Bitcoin, wh wh whatever really, see, see what comes up today. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Watch it, Gary. Hey, the same. Good, good to see you again. You, I, th I think you've actually got a sun lamp and you're just pretending to be out in the sunshine there. Well, I was going to say, everywhere you go, you seem to bring the sunshine with you, Gary. It's the third week running where uh, there are some clouds on the horizon, but uh, it's sunny at the moment. Hey, excellent. That's, that's good news. And hey, Chris, good to see you back again. Good evening, Gary. Good to see you. Likewise. And we've got um, a visitor today. Is that um, Suze? How are you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah, Suze hey. Append. Well, ah, okay. What we're, we're about to you, Suze? In in Kent, in in the Medway chat house. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, it always gets confusing. I, I, I have bad hearing at times, working out where people are actually from in there. Because um, occasionally we get calls where people are dialing in from Germany um, and the, the states and that kind of thing. So it, it looks like we're all fairly local today, which is great. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome, sir. Good to see you. Yeah, where, where, where did you hear about the group, sir? Oh, on your Telegram, but you know, remember, or you might, we have spoken on Women in Blockchain Talks. Ah! And so I operate under various names. Okay. <laughs> so was that where I, I shared with you details of a contact for someone else who works at your company? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's always funny when I, I speak to people in organizations, and I, I sometimes know about things that are going on in their organization that they didn't <laughs> or, or people or whatever so or, always interesting that's, that's good oh, we'll, we'll see where that goes so what, what's what's new with everybody at the moment what's happening um for saying you're you're following the ripple um debate quite closely aren't you you're actually lis listening in on the court appearances yes i actually dialed in um using uh it was, it was quite nice i used the um, an outfit called dent which are um themselves are based in Hong Kong and they've listed the cryptocurrency that they use for data. It's one of these projects, it, it may do well, it may not, but I dialed in and listened to the whole thing um, and it, it was great. It was really quite exciting to be have a ringside seat to see uh, how Ripple's council um, go for the SEC, essentially the SEC. Um, yeah, I think so. It, it, it didn't conclude. Um, the judge wanted further time to come back with a statement, which we're going to expect next week. And that was based on the SEC using MOUs and the Ripple saying that the, the approach that they're taking for discovery to demand information from regulators who then subsequently go to the firms operating in their jurisdiction, jurisdictions and demand further information from them because it's compulsory um, that's an unfair advantage, So, which I tend to agree with, but then I would because I'm an XRP holder. And uh, But yeah, that was fascinating to actually be able to dial in. All right. But that, that's curious, isn't it, about people actually saying that, that the regulator has unfair advantage over us. <laughs> that's <laughs> quite, quite a novel thing. I, I guess it, it gives credit, really, to some of the American system that are doing that. Because my understanding as well is that they're using effectively a discovery process to understand how the SEC's decisions around Bitcoin and Ethereum were reached. Is that right? That's right. So Ripple have asked for those uh, correspondence to be disclosed. And the SEC is obviously trying to avoid that from happening. We all think it's because there is probably some shenanigans in there that they don't want to have revealed mm -hmm. in, uh, in the court of law. But um, yeah, this, this whole thing, this particular um, kind of correspondence or the meeting they had on Friday was based uh, around the, the mode that they're using to um, request information. It's an unfair advantage, essentially. That's what Ripple, Ripple was saying. They don't have that capability to, to go and demand that kind of information. 
Okay, but, but ultimately that means that where people are saying that they are winning in inverted commas, it's that they're winning on procedural actions, not on actual court decisions or anything. Yeah. I think that's right for the time being, yes. Okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where that goes then. Is, is there a, a date by which there is a decision due? We're expecting something from the judge on this particular motion next week, but even that isn't confirmed. Okay, yeah. but, but that's just on the motion with grounds for appeal and that kind of thing, as opposed to... And it, it is, in really simple terms, is this all about the SEC saying that um, XRP is a security? Right. Uh, and therefore they should have gone through the whole securities process. Yeah, after eight years of consultation with Ripple, they, they, they've now decided that it was a security. Actually, the, in the, the lawsuit itself is aimed more at Chris uh, Larson and Ripple and um, uh, Brad Garlinghouse. It, it's to degorge them of the sales, profits they made from sales of XRP. It's not even offering clarity on um, the regulatory status of the token as a security token, unlike every other regulator in the world, including the FCA, which I believe has registered there as a utility or a uh, token. Okay, so that's interesting because I was on a call a few days ago with a webinar hosted by Stephen Pally, who is a US lawyer who specializes in the insurance sector, but it, it was about crypto. He's, he's very knowledgeable about crypto. And Preston Byrne as well, who's an ex -UK, I think it's ex UK lawyer, in fact, um, and again a crypto thing. And they were talking about the Ripple case and how, in some ways, it almost looks as though Ripple's trying to get the Howie test redefined in some way. And they say, yeah, I can't see that happening somehow. Well, this, this, yeah, if they settle out of court, then yeah, it, it, it won't define, redefine anything. But if they actually win, then yeah, it sets a pretty interesting precedent. Yep, no, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Excellent, okay. Anyway, just been joined by Bjorn as well. Hi Bjorn, our international contender, who I get to say the magic words, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you work faster than me, I noticed it did. Hi everybody. Mm. Oh, it's beautiful weather there in the UK, it seems, uh, Hussein. <laughs> yeah, again, so far, there are a few clouds on the horizon, but the sun was out earlier. I hope they're coming from here then and they leave us. Sorry? I was going to say, I think Hussein's, he's actually got a green screen. And, and that's actually just a, a fake background he's got. So I, I'm in England and there's a little bit of sunshine around, but there's some big black clouds as well. Okay, yeah, no, we had one beautiful day. That was the day where the lockdown was semi-lifted. Uh, and then after that, they told us two weeks rain, and they're always right with the rain. They're never right with the sun, unfortunately. Okay, well, it's always the case. But I always say, if you want to get weather forecasting to be accurate and correct, then move to Nevada, because that's about the, only place, it's the only place in the world where you'll ever get. I, I used to love it when I was out there. I was mm. like, what's the, what's the weather forecast today? Well, it's going to be 80 degrees, and that's it. That's <laughs> yeah. not true. Well, back, back to the crypto world, so, so just conscious um, with you being new, new, new on here, we don't have any particular format or anything, we just talk about whatever people want to talk about. So I don't know if you've come along today with anything in particular you'd like to either share or that you'd like to know more about, or you're just generally curious about the Yeah, topic. at the moment I'm just curious, at some mm -hmm. point I might, you know, contribute, but today I'm just listening more or less and mm -hmm. ask questions. Hey, that's good. Ask away. That's why it's good because we've got the likes of um, Chris, who I'd describe at one end of the spectrum, was quite a novice. I think he's developed and become quite experienced quite quickly. Is that right, Chris? Um, well, yes, I suppose so. I mean, I mean, what interests me over the last couple of weeks is that Ethereum seems to be now uh, acting very much more on its own, not following Bitcoin and becoming a much more stable system which is interesting we'll see what that brings in the long term yeah yeah well, I, I know a few people who are real fans of ethereum and the, and they don't track it in terms of its dollar price or anything they track it in terms of its relative price to bitcoin uh, and they're quite pleased that it's working its way up 
So that, that, that's an encouraging thing. So yeah, the, the Ethereum's definitely one to watch at the moment, as, as is Ripple with the court case. And um, yeah, what was the other thing? Earlier on this week, V Chain that Hussein was it something you made a note on that earlier on today? Yeah, I, I really like V Chain. It's a kind of operational supply chain management, and they're also moving into the NFT space. It's one of those projects where I think quite a lot of people who are into it unsurprisingly think it's undervalued but genuinely if you look at it, if you look at the fundamentals and the utility of this thing it's you know lots of very strong leadership with experience strong community bags of partnerships um with some you know huge entities and support from some degree of support from the chinese state as well okay. uh, so it's a very promising project and there's a lot going on there because i was going to say i think asia asia based I don't think they're specifically age. Well, their CEO, uh, oh, sorry, their CEO, the guy who's running it. I, I shouldn't use terms like that. Well, the, the team leader is, um, he was the CIO of Louis Vuitton in China. They have lots of connections, but the guy's well connected globally, I think. The chap, Sonny, I think his name is, is pretty well connected okay. globally. Okay, because the whole Chinese thing is getting interesting at the moment. So I'm, I'm noticing. C completely different um, sector, the, in the insurance industry, where th they've just realized that if you look at the top 10 largest insurance companies, five of them are Chinese, you know, in the, in the entire world. And actually, if you add up the market capitalization together, just those five companies represent about 20% of the global value of world insurance kind of thing. And then you look at, you know, in the city of London, uh, Ping An, um, they own the Lloyds of London building. So again, insurance. So people are beginning to wake up to the fact that the Chinese have been acquiring all sorts of assets, whether it's properties, companies, businesses, supply chain. You've got the One Road program around the world. Uh, and I think people are just beginning to wake up now. It's like, the, um, was it the, the uh, How Do You Boil a Frog? The whole idea that you do it a little bit at a time and nobody notices. Um, I, I think as people begin to see how I um, operate in most of the infrastructure in some countries, they begin to realise it. I'm seeing a similar thing with crypto. But uh, as you say, you, you've got the likes of VeChain where there's an influence. Um, they're certainly expanding with um, DCP, which, which is the state-run um, digital currency. But I'll have Avoid saying it's cryptocurrency because I don't think it is. So yeah, they're, they're doing all things in that space. Hey, Bernard, see you've joined us. Good evening to you. Hi, Gary. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I got my video off. Um, I got my kids um, with me, so I just um, had the video off. No, not not a problem at all. So, so has anyone been watching anything else that's been happening in the crypto world this week? Anything exciting then? Well, wow. I attended a uh, webinar with, with Germans, Germany, and apparently they are doing a government-backed uh, project on digital identity. So tying stuff together, together with the uh, COVID health pass. And if anyone is following Germany, they are a bit behind the digital curve. So <laughs> I'm glad to see it. <laughs> and surprised that, you know, even the government is now getting involved and in getting things, you know, enabling things. So I, I, I'm surprised you think that Germany's behind the curve yeah, because Baffin, which is the financial regulator, are pretty much up the, on a par with the FCA near enough. Um, and there are some crypto friendly regulations coming through in that. You've got Berlin in particular has got a really good uh, crypto community. Uh, it was quite, quite a yes. few people and that kind of thing. But, but in terms of like normal digital, as you know, when, when COVID hit, you know, everything is like paper and the Germans are very, um, ooh, data. <laughs> oh, but it is also a, a, a pretty good thing, to be honest, right? I, think, I, I used to work a lot with German banks and uh, I used to live in Germany as well. And there's just a lot of regulations for, for people's safety. In place, but also the Gesundheitskarte that you, because I, I suppose you are from Germany then. I am, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the Gesundheitskarte is also really digital and really innovative, but blocked by, by GDPR or APG or whatever you call it in, in things. In, in Germany, they are really protective of data, that's correct. Um, 
in all fairness, I, I, I don't see it as a really bad thing. In some countries, it's they are balance. really, well, that's the whole thing. Yeah, where, where, where did you put the balance? And if everybody would exactly understand how data would work, then this would be a really good thing and it would be really easy. But there is a lot of people out there that, well, yeah, that don't have a clue how much can be done with data. But it's interesting coming back to the digital identity piece because you've got projects like ID2020 mm. and you've, you've got a number of digital identity projects, several of which are blockchain based, um, several of which working with the EU observatory, I think it is, which is the, the, the blockchain kind of innovation piece. So I, I thought Europe in general was trying to do a lot of stuff around digital identity and COVID was almost being used as an accelerator for that. Mm. You know, the, 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 the number of COVID passport applications you're seeing beginning to appear, you know, which is one of those fascinating <laughs> things that from a technology point of view, I find all of that fascinating. From a societal perspective, I found it outright, outright worrying. Um, it, exactly. And, and the biggest issue is Europe is not one Europe. Everybody has its own rules, regulations, and even, uh, what's the word? The social factor how open mm -hmm. are you for the netherlands for example is, is a really digital uh, country and if you look at uh, what is it lithuania i think or uh one of those countries over there they're even far far more but in germany i mean look at how many places there are where you cannot even pay with ec yet so uh, estonia is probably a, a really Sorry, good yes. example because you, you've got the e-registry scheme that they set up in 2016 2017 i think it was yeah um with the help of guard time who are a very interesting company i, I won't go into it more than that but mm. do, do check, check out guard time and um where, where they come from on that but a, a very leading edge um digital identity scheme that was launched for the citizens mm. which worked really well and then I, I actually use it as one of my case studies in the, the training i do because Estonia being such a small country, I think there's fewer than 3 million people population. Mm. You can actually fit that whole blockchain identity scheme uh, on my laptop and, and have space free, uh, space for, which is where they launched it, where you can actually apply for an e-registry passport now. Uh, for, you don't have to be an Estonian mm -hmm. citizen. So, right. so they already use that for digital identity. And I, I was fascinated. I was giving a talk on that a while ago. And then somebody said, oh, yeah, well, we've done that in our country as well. It's like, oh, well, which country is that? It was uh, Georgia. Mm. And Georgia, for those who kind of understand geography, will understand the, the common interest that Estonia and Georgia have of um, that they're bounded uh, against Russia. Exactly, yeah. Is, is the, the connection with the whole, why do you want an immutable register of who your citizens are and, and what property they own, and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so lots, lots of things going on with um, digital identity. So it's definitely. Yeah. Did, the, um, did, did anybody check out by any chance the, the new, I, I, what is it, an IDO, I think, called CrossFed? Basically, Pancake Swap meets Uniswap. So you can do a, the one is for Binance, the other one for Ethereum. This one, hey, they combine it, very original. So what was that like a, a stable coin to do atomic transfers or something? No, basically it's it's an IDX uh, or an IDO uh, place. I think it, ah. you can raise funds, right? Okay. It's like exactly like PancakeSwap, but where PancakeSwap only supports Binance and Uniswap only supports Ethereum. These guys came with the great idea: hey, let's support both, right? Yeah. I mean. But what they, I, I, I was following this and I was trying to get in, I didn't get in, but then now just, not even an hour ago, I think, they just came with an update where I don't know if I, yeah, I can share my screen somehow, right? Uh, yeah, should be able to do that, hang on, I'll... Because this, it's, I just wanted to have your, your thoughts on this. I mean, something went a bit weird, I think. And yeah. basically what they did was they raised funds uh, they first had a private sale, or one sec. Um, yeah, they first had a private or a pre sale, then a public sale. Um, but at the moment, they just said, hey, it went so well that we just raised the, the cost of a token by a factor, well, I think from 
1.2 cents to 21 cents. Wow. And from 1.6 cents to 28 cents. And I was just wondering, what is your thought on, on this and how is this even possible? Uh, I'm, I'm suspicious of anything that increases 20 fold that quickly. Well, <laughs> these people, so these people, they, they invested their finance. Oh, here's my share screen, one sec. Uh, so they're just providing a platform for you to launch it effectively an ICO, but but as um through the exchange. This is what you see my screen now, right? Yeah. Yep. So this is, I think, what they just launched this. Uh, I don't know how long ago does it say? A two minute read. Okay. This is from today, from like two hours ago. They just finished their public sale, I think. Okay. And then they said, "Oh, there are so many people that want the tokens." So, and we can only have a hundred people in the case of the old price. So, you know what? We just raise the price and, and we, and we <laughs> grab more money. I'm, I'm always suspicious of any project that um, puts in place a limit in some way. The, the, the whole scarcity thing is always interesting. That, that always sets off a, a, an alarm bell with me. Yeah. No, but this is, this is, I don't know, I was just following this, as I said, and then I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you you okay. just raise the price so everybody that already invested gets, what is it then, 10 times less tokens, even more than 10 times less tokens, so you can settle them for the upgraded price to other people. <laughs> okay. Right? The, so. But the, the, the thing is, the, the very fact that they are saying now that they will increase the prices and they'll increase the scarcity, I, again, there's, there's a list of red flags that are going off in my mind about that. Um, particularly, I'm, I'm always nervous. Most companies have stopped doing it now, but I still see it occasionally with companies saying, oh, yeah, well, this means that our token will increase by. Straight away, that's an FCA price promotion. Type thing. See, the, the, the scary thing of this one is this was not mentioned. Okay. This this just happened after the public sale. They they did not distribute the tokens yet, and, and basically now they're saying, look, uh, everybody gets less tokens. No, it, it, yeah, exactly. This is what my reaction was. I was thought, of course, their Telegram channels are both now on. Uh, you cannot uh, speak. They are both on mute. Okay. This is just really uh, because the platform sounded really interesting, but this is just yeah, I don't know. It's, so it's, it's beginning to, I don't know, are you, are you familiar with the story of OneCoin? No. Okay, so, so OneCoin one is amazing because it's the largest ever cryptocurrency scam that wasn't a cryptocurrency. Okay. And what it was, it was, it was a complete scam, um, I believe, I'll just carry out that just in case there's any lawyers in the room, mm -hmm. um, where they were promoting... Um, effectively a new Bitcoin blockchain was the way they kind of described it. Mm -hmm. but they, they promoted it exclusively, not through the crypto community, who would have seen through it straight away, but they, they promoted it exclusively through the MLM community, so the multi-level marketing community, mm -hmm. who are used to these pyramid type things. Yeah, of course. And then it is run by, I've forgotten the lady's name, I think she's Bulgarian, Ignita, so someone who's known as the crypto queen anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they estimate that there's something like about, I'm sure I've seen a number of $4 billion got gone into this project. Uh, and she has now disappeared. Her, oh, brother, huh. her brother has appeared in court. That kind of thing. And there's a great podcast on BBC. So the BBC yeah. podcast site, um, I've, I've got it. I met a producer of the program. They're going to turn it into a TV program as well soon. Seriously? Yeah, well, but... but and, and it's fascinating. Yeah. But, but it kind of sounds similar to this because that they had it where they had loads of big shows on at various places and exhibitions and all the yee-haw and fan dozy stuff, hyping it all up. And then at one point they announced that due to the success of it, they were going to some like double the amount of coins that would be in circulation. Which, if you're an existing token holder, you'll know that doubling the amount of coins in a circulation means that it, it halves the value of what you've got. So it's simply oh, economics. Yeah. Um, 
However, they, they convinced everybody it was the opposite. And I, and I said, it's, we're, we're doubling the circulation and that's going to make your coins worth even more. Uh -huh. so, so buy okay. more of them. So <laughs> this, this, this kind of sounds a bit like that. Yeah, it, it, it's really weird because, as I said, the public seal was finished. And then, see here, it says public seal update. Uh, we're already in a meeting. You can see this also, right, my telegram now? I, I, I can see down to the where it says the real difference will be applied to the prices. Uh, where else? Can I, I, uh, <laughs> Dr. Rouge or Ignatova. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, this, this was... Uh, just calm down. Yeah, see, the public sale was even over. Hard cap is reached. At fourteen uh, at, at two o'clock my time, so that okay. is uh, one o'clock your time. So if a hard cap's been reached, that that is done programmatically. That's usually uh, built into the contract. It, well, it the, should. And then at, at five o'clock they say, "Hey, we increased the price per token." So because there was also a hard cap that you could <laughs> pay like two BNB, right? And so okay. two BNB would be I don't know a thousand tokens. And now they say, look, we increased the price of a token by tenfold, even more than tenfold. So instead of a thousand tokens for your two BNB, you get a uh, hundred tokens, and the remainder of the tokens we sell to the other people that came next in line. Okay. Well, all, all I'll offer is I'll reserve judgments until digging into it. But yeah. it, it probably reflects really well the whole thing about people say about do your own research and check into these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, this you also haven't seen before, right? That that was basically my question. Yeah, no, it's it's not familiar. But then <laughs> I, I I get lots of these coming through, and, and you get them sometimes. A, a particular popular one, I think, is Pi, where people keep saying, "Is Pi legitimate or is it a scam?" Because all it seems to be doing at the moment is asking for everyone's email address, right? And nothing else. So you, you get loads of these, and I just don't know. So what do you think about Pi? Actually, because I got invited like a gazillion times. I, I, I can't work out what it is beyond a means of collecting people's email addresses. Yeah, but the funny thing is, so I signed up after that because now I can tell people, look, I have five. Leave me alone. Just, just sign me up. Okay. But I never got a message from them. The marketing is really limited. Um, they have a telegram now. That, that's basically it, actually. But I also don't understand what, what they're doing. Are they using my phone to mine? Hmm. Right? That could be something. <laughs> Well, I think so. I got into Pi a little bit, just had the proper look at it, and um, you've got to hand it to them in terms of in terms of their uh, kind of multi-level marketing. They absolutely smashed it. Sure. I think they got ten million people globally and growing. Yeah. And um, all you're getting really, so you have to log in and you have to tap it, and you can invite, you know, build your mining pool. Mining is just logging in. It's just logging into the app and tapping it. So there's nothing more sophisticated to it than that. I've noticed that they're advertising on, on the app and it's a horrifically terrible app. Correct. It's the worst I've ever seen. And I've been in technology for quite a long time. Um, it's shockingly bad. Um, so check this, check this, how big your telegram is. Oh, can you know? Right. 850, um, 818,000 people. That there was something that I read, I think it was in their white paper, that they were talking to Stellar Lumen around potentially using, and you know, Stellar Lumen is from our friend uh, Jed McCaleb. Um, they were going to use that uh, as, as a blockchain eventually. So turn this effectively uh, kind of a reward token, for want of a better term, into a proper blockchain listed asset. And that's when you become incredibly wealthy, except I doubt that will ever happen. Um, <laughs> some rumors that it's just a fake. It's like, it's just a fraud. It's just an experiment in, you know, psychology. I kind of believe that one. Um, although I think they are making money. From is it me that's getting that broken up or is it? <laughs> Um, it's him again. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting one. It's one of these ones you, you, don't, you don't really know until down the road, do you, as to whether something turns out real or not. But that's why I, that's why I always love Ponzi coin, which is my favourite uh, scam that wasn't a scam. Yeah, true. Not, not in directly crypto terms, but one of the things that uh, I think is quite concerning is the growth of the central bank digital currency operations. Mm. There's a lot of stuff going on with that at the moment. So I was on a, um, 
there, there was a conference this week which was all about central bank digital currencies and it was quite fascinating listening to various people in there and, and you're right there's, there's a lot of countries um researching it the bank of england is doing their stuff now with hm treasury yeah the, it's, it's going to give them tremendous power over all our finances it, it's wonderful for them not so, quite so good for us but it, it, it's one of those things that it, it, it's a fascinating concept that again from a technology point of view i think it's brilliant from yeah. a society point of view i think it's highly threatening but yeah i agree we'll, we'll see I spoke to Tom Mutton from, he's a FinTech director at the Bank of England, and we watched one of um, their conferences on CBDCs, and he was, he was very open, right? And, and one of the things that came across is that every country is going to have a different approach mm. for their central bank digital currency. There is no one size fits all. The UK certainly isn't going to follow what the China is, wants to achieve with their uh, central bank digital currency. And to some extent, even is happy for the, you know, I think there was an overwhelming vote to, to have a private public kind of partnership around the development of a CBDC in the UK. Um, if you look at the Bahamas, they, they've kind of moved forward with solving a very specific problem with their sand dollar. And I think every country is just going to have a slightly different approach. I think the US is probably going to be the last to adopt anything that looks like a CBDC. Um, but yeah, it's not one size fits all. And if I was in China, uh, Chris, I would be worried. Um, I'm not so worried in, in the UK at this stage. It's interesting you're saying about it, not one size fits all. Part of the discussion with the banks the other day was about how you also have two different requirements with the banks, even in one country. You've got the wholesale side of things and you've got the retail bank banking side of things. And it's almost like you need a, a digital currency, which is cash or the equivalent of cash. And then you've got one which is a settlement currency for doing like interbank settlements and effectively um, growth, growth settlements and this kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's not just that there'll be one size fits all for all banks. It's even within each, within each country. But I found it fascinating. I mean, the, the EU is doing a lot of work on this. And when you think about it, a, a digital euro is you know, quite, quite a reasonable idea. Um, but then I was asked by um, a, shall we say, a central European, but member of the EU um, banking group about coming to give them a talk about cryptocurrencies and digital currencies and that, because they were thinking of setting up their own central bank digital currency. I said, well, yeah, sure. The, that's fine, but you're part of the EU and you currently have the euro. So why are you even beginning to think about having something yourself? And they said, we're just looking for the future. So yeah. um, we, we, we shall see anyway. Hey, I think on. the danger is that once it's in place, um, although it starts off with uh, a somewhat broader thought processes, once the power is there, it can be manipulated later on yeah I, I, I had that conversation that i was at a bank of england webinar around what they were doing about digital currencies a couple of months ago and then i think it was the next day i was in the all-party parliamentary group on blockchain where, where they were talking about and they were talking about um digital currencies there and i, I made the point about it's all well and good having a a centralized ledger that allows you to have complete visibility of all transactions, which from an, an economist's point of view is brilliant. You know, you can actually, you can actually see real time what money supply is, and you can look at M3 and M1 and all those kind of things. But it's the fact that you can make the, to uh, the token or your currency programmable, so you can switch it off. So you might currently think you've got a thousand pounds in your bank account, um, but you upset someone in government and they say, that's now worth zero. Or we'll get it to um, pay your taxes automatically. We will see. Hey, Mark, see, see if you come and join us. Got Mark, Mark online there. Yeah, staying quiet or staying on mute. So is anyone else hearing any other news of anything happening? See, Ethereum still keeps going up in price. 
What I uh, wanted to ask, uh, Gary, is the, what you just mentioned, isn't that already possible with the current system as well? No, because if I've got cash, um, cash okay. is the ultimate thing, you, you can't really do that. Although even with cash, what you can do is like they did in India, where you suddenly say, well, the 5,000 rupee note is no longer usable. Of course, and but it, I mean, uh, there is still a, a group of people playing with cash, correct? And this mm -hmm. is exactly the difference between the Netherlands, for example, and, and Germany. Uh, whereas in, in Germany, there is, is a lot of places where you cannot pay with your contactless card. In the Netherlands, there's actually a lot of places where you cannot pay with cash anymore. Okay. Right? So, I mean, that is already gone. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know how it is in the UK if cash is still is, is really involved and there is still a lot of being done in cash. It, it, here, it's, it's, it's dropping and dropping. That I can't remember the exact numbers. Where I think it was dropping in use by about 10 to 15 percent per year, mm. but but that was prior to COVID, and yeah. since COVID, it's really accelerated. I mean, I actually said to someone yesterday, I, I was in a coffee shop, and um, they said, "We're really sorry, but would you mind awfully because our machines are broken? Do you have any cash?" Yeah. <laughs> and, it's like, yeah. and I kind of had to think about it. It's like, well, oh yeah, yeah, I've got I've got one of these. Oh, it's a five pound note, you know. So yeah, we are very much going into the digital type payments. Well, yeah, and then based on what you said, of course, leaving cash is, is a different system, but I mean, at the moment also they, they could, if they wanted to manipulate your bank account and stuff like that. In, in uh, fact, you're, you're right, so they, they did that in Cyprus. Um, yeah, true, they, exactly. They locked yeah. up the, the pin machines back then. They, yeah, well, you know what? You can only get so much cash. Yeah, the, 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 the difference is that they can only do that to the entire user base. So, you know, you can switch off ATMs or you can uh, do a haircut on people's bank accounts or whatever. That's kind of a general thing. What you can't easily do is you can't say, well, everyone's currently got a thousand pounds in their bank account, but Gary, we're going to switch your individual bank account off uh, as a government. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a bank, you know, my, my, my bank could choose to do that. Okay. If, if they thought I was using cryptocurrency, they probably would do. Um, <laughs> exactly. You get a uh, nice letter first, but yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, but, but at the moment, there's, there's no means for a government to uh, uniquely um, li limit somebody. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. And as, it, as someone was saying, going back to China, uh, mm -hmm. them linking the whole social ranking index yeah. with artificial intelligence, with digital identity using facial recognition. Uh, it really is, I keep saying, if, if anyone wants to know what's gonna happen with technology in the future, uh, just go and watch Black Mirror. Right. Because the, the author of Black Mirror, um, whose name escapes me, Fopan, has painted such a dystopian future that is likely to happen. Uh, and you look at what's going on in China and that, and they're pretty close to it. Yeah, well, the, even if you look way back when Total Recall, the first version with, uh, what's his name, Schwarzenegger, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff is out there now. Oh, I, mean, oh, oh. The, I don't know if you have it over there as well, but over here, Domino's is now delivering everything with electrical bikes. Yeah? Okay. okay. Um, it, it's, it sounds exactly like those movies from way back when, when the electric cars were driving by, you just heard it. So anyway, it, it, even the sound is already out there in the streets here. Well, I'm trying to remember, was it Total Recall, which was where the computers basically took over the planet eventually? And, uh, and you had a big Terminator. That was uh, uh, the Terminator, okay. okay. Because, because I was talking about that with somebody the other day. Mm -hmm. like you, you had a concept called Skynet. Yeah, yeah, that's Terminator. The, the, the cluster of computers and satellites around the world controlling everything. And I, w I was blown away. I was helping uh, run a blockchain event about three years ago now, I think it was, mm. um, with the, mil the British military. So it was like Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, some of the suppliers, uh, you know, some of the manufacturers and that kind of And we were helping them understand blockchain and its potential in supply chain, this kind of thing. And one of the colonels came along and he gave a presentation on what was effectively Skynet, um, which actually is a term that they use for, I think it's the British Navy's um, comms, 
but using a, a blockchain-based platform for command, control, and intelligence um, in theater, so on the battlefield. And I looked at it and I went, that's Robocop and Terminator. Yeah. All in one, yeah. I, I keep telling people, if you want to know what's going to... These movies inspire the generation that is creating technology now. See, look at the tablet with, with Steve Jones. Yeah. Yeah, he also stole the, I stole the idea, the concept, but he made it possible. And that's what you're seeing a lot. In, in Total Recall, one of the things was he was walking down the, the airport and his uh, marketing billboard yeah, that's was happening. interacting with him. Like, hey, this is he. So he likes this marketing. You see that in the streets already. All these small things are now really coming together. Yeah. And but, let's face it, Hollywood works together with a lot of universities and ask what is coming up. So it, they don't just make it up from thin air, right? They really talk to smart people. And so ultimately, if you want to know what's going on in the crypto world, start watching old episodes of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, 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 a lot was inspired, true. It sounds really stupid and we're laughing about it, but it is true. Yeah. This is what is inspiring people. Well, it's interesting, some of the people I know in the crypto community, um, particularly on, on the Ethereum side of things, they are total uh, cyberpunks right. who, you know, it, it's about this kind of like the, um, the science fiction side of things and dystopian worlds where you need some means of payment transfer without involving a government and all this kind of thing. So, yeah, we're getting close. But what I think is, is really scary, though, is that everybody's anti-government now. At least we elected them. But the power that Google, Facebook, and those companies get, or Amazon, they don't care about. But to me, it's still, I think it's, it's more scary to have it, I guess, to have the power in a, in a, in a commercially, uh, in a commercial organization than in a, in, in a government, to be honest. Well, that's the point, isn't it, with Facebook in Germany, that was being mentioned before about um, re regulation and that. Well, wasn't it that uh, Facebook's come up against another big problem about um, um, GDPR or something to do with how they're using the data? Well, um, and like, you, you had that massive data breach the other week, which hardly seems to have been mentioned, even though 533 million um, email accounts or whatever. Um, and yet you don't really see it appearing in the news. <coughs> so I, I think you're right on that. Uh, good, good point. Hey, we've got someone else come and join us. Uh, Simon, hello. Come, come off mute and say hi. How off, how off mute do you need? <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. Hey there, Simon, how are you? I'm fine, fine. Just uh, cooking supper, so you'll have to excuse me turning the video off for a bit. I'll listen in and, and no, pick no, no, and annoy no. everyone in a minute. No, no problem. What, what brings you along today then, Simon? You got a particular interest in crypto? Oh, good God. On the basis of the people who are listening, yeah, I've been in it for years. Been in it since about 2013. Um, built a couple of blockchain solutions, forked, um, forked Qtum, um, um, how can I say this? Um, got a tokenization solution. We have okay. a, an SRO, um, a um, full stock exchange in Barbados, um, and we're tokenizing a number of, well, of, of assets in a completely regulated environment, do all kinds of things. Just one of my friends suggested that I, I turn up whilst we're cooking supper and have a listen in. <laughs> but yeah, well, been, well, been well, some time. I, I'm missing some of the current fashion, um, but yeah, you know, I'm I'm a developer and been doing all kinds of stuff for some years. So you cool. can find me on find me on LinkedIn. Obviously, yeah. I hide some of my crypto stuff on LinkedIn because we don't want to be showing things like that. But but there you go. Yeah, that's fine. Well, welcome welcome aboard. Yeah, it's just a, a real mixed bag that we talk about <coughs> anything that people find of interest at the moment, really. So if there's anything in the news of, of interest, or we have a mixture of people who are anything from complete novice through to complete experts. Uh, and everything door. I'm just shutting the door, so keep talking. <laughs> no problem. So uh, everything in between. So Sue, so, so how are you finding things? Because you've been exploring this area for a while, haven't you? Uh, the uh, privacy stuff? <laughs> the, no, the, the whole crypto space. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have um, embarked on this MOC in, with Nicosia. 
oh, yeah. universities, so that's coming to an end. Um, that, that's probably one of the most in-depth courses I've done. I found it very deep and well recommended for anyone who wants to really understand how wallets work and how hashing works and that kind of thing. That's good. Yeah, they have very well good resources, good reading lists. It's all digital, so you know, easily accessible. So you don't have to buy lots of books. So yeah. good. And now I'm looking to see, you know, whether I can try something hands on. Well, there's certainly plenty of opportunities around. It's, it's a matter of working out well. I think um, 2021 is going to be an interesting year. I think everyone's trying to actually do things at last as opposed to um, the theory. So there sh should be some good things on that. Excellent. And, and Simon, you, you, you mentioned S SRO, I think. What, what was that? Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Self-regulating organi organisation. So when you, well, a stock exchange. A full stock exchange. So we've we've moved on from um, we we've moved on from traditional exchanges and stuff. But what we what we've done is we've constructed a solution whereby we can tokenize securities, and fractionalize ownership of securities. Uh, but we're doing it through a regulator. Uh, we've we've got a full license in Barbados. Um, you can find us tokenize, spelt with an S, the English way. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, we're regulated in the UK, but we haven't got um, a full license here in the UK yet, but we've got one in, in Barbados to fire up a full exchange. And we're talking to a number of different, um, different organizations around securitizing and giving um, fractional ownership of assets, everything from real estate to artwork. Um, because if you move on from, um, I, I, and I don't know the context of, of how we've been talking about things here for a couple of weeks, if you move on from, you know, the, the traditional uh, picture of, 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 of what, what we use crypto for, if you consider taking something like um, uh, a unique asset that's worth money, fractionalize the ownership, construct a company around it, you can have, you can use um, crypto just like shares mm -hmm. really and, and that's what we've built like I said you can find our company out there we, we've um, we, we're a whole group of um, of, of long-time finance industry folks just trying to do things slightly differently mm -hmm. and why will it work well one of the things let's just pick something I don't know um, a work of art let's say at the moment a work of art is probably worth a lot of money. Let's say you're looking at 20 million pound work of art. There's probably a dozen people in the world who can benefit from the ownership of that and the growth and the value, the growth and value of that because it's one big thing. It's the mother of all NFTs. Okay. But if I could come to you and say, um, you know, for a thousand dollars you could buy into um, um, a piece of art or a fractional ownership of a piece of art. It mm. might be a safe bet. Um, it's a bit like buying, selling shares and stuff. It's it's no different. Yeah. Um, so, so it's yeah, interesting. That, but we've got a we've, we've got a stock exchange license to, to do that, and we're building that business out at the moment. Oh, I definitely recommend everyone take a look at that uh, yeah. when we come off the call. It's no, diff it's no different to the models that you're we're considering these days um, with, um, with with crypto. It, you've just got to move on from the definition of value. Okay. About value is only being a security and start thinking it that way. So you mentioned real estate. I, I find that really interesting because I, I've tracked about 60, I think it is, um, real estate tokenization projects. Like I, IHT token and stuff. Yeah, and, and each of them have failed because you can generally only have fractional ownership of a property down to like 20, maybe 30 people, depending upon which country you are unless you have like a special purpose vehicle in the middle in some way. I, I just wondered if that's something that you'd managed to address in any way. Well, we haven't addressed it yet, but it's something that we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting okay. messages from other people who are listening to this call at the moment who are going, oh, is that you talking, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, it, it's something that's got to change. Um, yeah. and, and at the end of the day, 
one of the, the phrases we use, and it's probably overused, is, is the, de the, the democratization of securities. Okay. Because there are a whole bunch of people out there that just don't have access to markets for large assets. And one of the problems if you've got a large asset to finance is that you don't have access to a market that, you know, that um, can't buy smaller than $5 million chunks. Mm -hmm. So what we can bring through, you know, fully regulated SRO is the ability to, to, um, uh, fractionalize ownership and actually benefit those people with those assets that are trying to raise cash. Okay. It's, uh, it, it's crowdfunding on steroids, but the industry uh, needs to get itself in better shape with better stories and better controls. And I, I guess the other thing as well is it allows you to go into like the kind of like the secondary market as well. Totally. Yeah. Uh, which, which hopefully opens things up. That's really, really good. Um, yeah. but not sorry. Uh, I just noticed you said, uh, Ah, yeah. So I'm just, I'm just reading through the notes here as people are talking both online and in text that Hussein said he's working with some of them. So I presume is that the real estate side of things? Yeah. So this is actually going to what Simon was saying, um, uh, fractional low cost access to equities is something that we're looking at um, to give our customers at Siglu. I can't actually say who we're working with at the moment because we haven't, we're on the process of elaborating or evaluating a number of, of, of providers for those things. But we certainly see, again, democratization of access to assets that normally you wouldn't be able to access. Um, let's say you want to buy one pound's worth of Tesla. Now, there are people that want to do that um, and maybe even benefit from dividends or whatever else is being offered as part of that security. So I think it's, it's a huge space and exactly what Simon's saying as well around, you know, things that couldn't have been easily securitized in the past. Um, now I think we've heard of REITs or most of us have heard of REITs where you have fractional access to it, to a building and you have to go through a, a registered security exchange to get it it's a bit of a pain um it's making that simple making that process as simple as possible again like a little bit like bringing challenger banking ethos to that sector which is what ziggly try and try to do for crypto um so i think yeah it's a huge space it's definitely a growth area but when you start doing something like that doesn't that effectively mean that you're offering a form of a crypto derivative and then that falls within the UK FCA rules on right. crypto derivatives. Okay, that's a really interesting question. It's, yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked to the regulator about it yet. Um, which means you can't, in that instance, you can't sell it to someone in the UK who isn't a kind of registered uh, kind of uh, high net worth individual or, or can, knows how to manage their money, apparently. So, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. But it's kind of a little bit bizarre because if I understand the FCA's crypto regulation around derivatives, it's that you can't have a derivative that is a derivative of crypto, um, which is why you can't have like a Bitcoin ETF or anything like that anymore. Um, but that doesn't say that you can't use crypto to create a derivative based on a traditional asset. Mm. So you're almost going down this road. I, I can't get it in a way that what they're saying is that crypto is highly speculative, highly volatile, and with derivatives, you typically have gearing and ratios and that, so it makes it insanely risky. Um, but it doesn't preclude using crypto for actually doing a traditional asset. So I, I don't, I don't know who's saying if if you're in the sandbox at the moment, but I know one of the, one of our partners and, and our platform. We've been in the FCA sandbox for some time now. Um, and if you sort of trip, trip around the world into various different, um, different countries, lots of them look to the FCA for advice and inspiration on the way things are going to go. But also lots of them follow the FCA rules um, and look at what's happening. And they will push it to the edge a bit, some of these countries, because um, they know where it's going to go. They've actually got quite a good clean start and they see fintech as very much a way forward um, for, for their own economies uh, um, and to stimulate banking in their own countries. And this is one of the things that we're riding on at the moment, because you know, if you look at many, many countries around the world, they do mirror the FCA rules. Um, and, and it's a big badge of importance, the way the FCA work. 
And I, I almost feel, and it's a Sunday afternoon and I've had a kind of IPA, I almost feel that you've got the sandbox, the FCA sandbox, and then you've got um, FCA friendly jurisdictions um, that talk. And the regulators do talk about what can work and what can be done properly. Um, and, and it's no way to diminish their importance in the whole of the network, but there are some jurisdictions that are happy to innovate and try things um, and, and to work with us. And I hope you're finding the same. Yeah, I, the FCA are one of the most innovative, I think. We, we work really closely with them. They've been very helpful, as, as is the Bank of England as well. I, I, just, I think the UK is definitely leading the charge from a regulatory perspective. Um, and, and I think, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore are innovative, but to a large extent, they're just following the FCA, um, which unsurprisingly, I think. So, I mean, to, to your point, Gary, I think that the main problem, I mean, I, I had crypto derivatives. They were, they were spread bets and CFDs on you know, XRP, BTC, whatever. And I think really what the FCA wanted to do is stop those leveraged instruments, put it, taking, taking them the ha out of the hands of a, uh, let's say young adults who didn't know much about how to use them. I think that's really what they were going for. We have a few frozen people. Seems like we lost Gary. Yeah. Yeah, here it's working still, I think. But I see. I, I think it's the old thing that they're, they're trying to protect Granny from losing her life savings. And I think Gary is out now. He has dropped out. Amazing. The, the Zoom is still going though. He normally finishes it off uh, on the hour quite. Exactly, yeah, right on the hour. Are you saying, is there, is there a way to contact you on, on Telegram? Are you also in the group or no? Um, yeah, I think um, I'm not, I am on Telegram actually. So if you just search for me on there, otherwise um, I'm on UK Crypto Facebook group. So you can find me there as UK well. UK Crypto Facebook group. And I have a few YouTube. questions about your, as you know, I'm, I'm involved in the project. I did this, I did told last week. And finally, after lockdown, we were able to launch this week. So we signed our first five customers. Congrats. And then uh, went like, yeah, thanks, man. It took, we started, as I told you, we started end of 2019 and then the lockdown. Week. Tough. So, uh, really happy that it finally launched. And, and there is some things that I would like to discuss with you with, with your wallet, basically. Yeah, sure. So it sounds like a good opportunity to do some one-to-ones from that. So hopefully this meet, this session was useful at doing some introductions now. I'm just conscious we've only got a few minutes left. Um, I, I do try to close these off on time for six o'clock. Does anyone have any particular questions or anything that they'd like to cover off before we close off for the day? No, everyone, uh, either everyone's gone frozen again or no one's got any questions. That, that, that's kind of good. But what is your best investment tip for the week, Gary? You should start doing that at the end of uh, each show. Your investment hey, tip. But Bjorn, I, I, I always say if you're looking for investment advice, yes. only, to, only take it from someone who's got three things. Okay? Right. Yeah. And these three things is that they have to have their own private island, yeah. their own private yacht. And their own private jet and they've got to have gained all three of those through crypto investing because okay. I, I see so many people who've got those three things but not through crypto no. so you know the um they had it before. head of amazon and that kind of thing mm -hmm. um or i know people who've made loads of money simply because they bought into bitcoin just when the price happened to go up right. and so they if therefore they think they're experts so I, I, I say most people do well out of crypto through pure good luck. <laughs> a few people do well through genuinely knowing what they're doing. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't count myself as one of those. Mm -hmm. So I, I always say that the measure is if they can prove that they've consistently done well, then listen to them. Don't listen to the ones who will show you a chart of what has already happened and then go on to explain why it happened. No, t tell them to tell me something that's going to happen in the future. And mm -hmm. does that mean that the price is going to go up, down, or sideways? And if they get that right five times consistently, 
then I'll start listening to them. Even five is it three? Three is not enough for you. It should even be five. Yeah. Like it, it, three is an indication of a trend, but it might still be fortunate. <laughs> you know, I, I can do better than that with blackjack, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. So, so my, my investment advice is go to the casino <laughs> with Gary. <laughs> Particularly when it's blackjack, I used to be <laughs> like that. But yeah, um, just listen to everybody, learn, and make your decisions. Mm-hmm. Is, is all I can offer. And there's certain red flags as well that when a project says this is definitely going to increase in value, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to double the circulation of the coins that we didn't tell you about. Oh, um, we double the, the price of the coin. They just posted another message again. It's, it's exactly what so. they're doing. Seriously, yeah. I know. Folks, it's six o'clock. We're going to have to close off, I'm afraid. But thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution. Hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, I always stick these up on YouTube afterwards as well so other people can watch. So um, hopefully see some of you again next week. Bye for now. Thanks, Thanks, Gary. Bye. Bye.